So good morning, everyone. Today we are we are going to do a bridge between the tour portion of excuse me. <coughs> The Torah portion of Noah had the Torah portion of Lech Lecha. Because as we know, last when we started our Torah class, it was Monday, and we were already technically past Breshit. But I wanted to start with Breshit because how could you start without the beginning? So you have to start with you have to start with the beginning, right? So let me just see this. Here. So you have to start with the beginning. And so we started with the Breshit. However, because of that, we kind of missed Shemot. I mean, uh, Noah, rather. And now we're at Lech Lecha. And there is an inherent connection between Lech Lecha and between uh, Noah. There's an inherent bridge. And that's what I want to discuss today. So we can bridge these two parshiot, the previous week's parsha, which is Noah, which we did not get to last week because we were doing Bereshit, which we did not get to the week before because it was a holiday. So we're going to do a bridge between Noah and Lech Lecha. So last, last week we discussed Bereshit, which is the, the beginning of creation, the beginning of, of the universe. And this week we are going into a discussion about civilization, the first civilization as we know it, which is the civilization that is recorded with Noah, and then the offshoots of the civilization to a particular form of civilization, which is really the beginnings of Judaism, which is, of course, the revelation that Abraham has with God. And before that, we know through the Medrash, his, his connection to God and his understanding of, of the world, which was very different than the people with whom he he lived. So today, that's going to be my focus, trying to make this bridge between Noah and Lech Lecha. And in fact, when we, we learn, when we study the book of Breshit and we go into the Torah portion of Noah, what we see is that we begin with Noah and the Torah qualifies Noah as a tzaddik, as a righteous man, and then the Torah pivots into the story of the Mabul, into the story of the destruction of the universe at that moment, at that time, which was this great flood, a tsunami, a, 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 an outpouring of water, the water from below, the water from above, which really changes the earth in an irrevocable fashion so that the Torah through the Medrash tells us that before the flood, everything was a lot bigger, stronger, and there was like a diminishment in the physicality of earth after the flood. It was a weakening flood. At the same time, it was a clarifying flood. And we have from God to the Jewish, to, to Noah actually, we have a, some kind of understanding and this understanding is symbolized by the rainbow. After the flood, God brings a rainbow and the rainbow symbolizes that God recognizes the inherent flaw in human nature, the inherent flaw of humanity, the inherent flaw in, in this creation called earth and specifically in this creation called humankind that, that the way uh, Noah, and the way it's put in Noah, it says that God understands, so to speak, that man is Rami Nu'orav, he is evil from his youth. And therefore, there is not much he can do to, to prevent a civilization from going awry. And therefore, God instructs the descendants of Noah and Noah with a framework of laws that will kind of keep them on the straight and narrow. But at the same time, God promises that he will never disrupt the, the nature of the universe in the same fashion. And in the language of the Torah, the, 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 uh, the disruption will, will not, it will not, uh, it will not be so devastating so that 
the way the Torah puts it, there will be cold days and hot days. There will be this, there will be the seasons. There will be the, there will be the, the, uh, the, the, the rotation of the sun. Everything will go according to a normative fashion and God will no longer tinker with the, the nature or the physics of earth itself. And it, he will let it be, even though humanity will come to the brink of much greater wickedness, as we know in history, after the destruction of the, of the, with the flood, the, humanity continues to evolve and not necessarily in a good way and continues to do evil. And just when we think that we do evolve and we have a certain hold on the evil, and the evil is somewhat behind us, we get a reminder that actually, no, there's a lot of ignorance and there's a lot of hate and hate and ignorance beget evil. So that we have such a long time later, so many, so many millennia later, we have the Holocaust. The Holocaust was an abject, a gross immorality on the, on the greatest scales known to mankind, which was to literally pick off in a genocidal fashion, a race off the planet, just because they, just because, and that's all. And so there was, it's not even, it's not even wars in of itself, like the war that is going on now between Ukraine and Russia. Wars in of itself are, are very, are very um, immoral in a certain fashion that they're, they, they're, they're really ego-driven and they're ego-driven, they're power-driven. And often if, if people would step, take a step back, wars can be prevented. And we know, let's say in the, in the history of the recent history of the United States, where there was a lot of contention with uh, Russia over the years and the missile crisis that happened in the sixties that, you know, they're for the grace of God and for some quick thinking people the world could have been also brought to uh, a world a world war that would have cost the lives of so many. So we see that it doesn't take much for war to erupt, but a genocide that just targets people for the race is completely on a different level. And we see that after all these years and after all the evil that happened during the times of Noah and the rectification, and the kind of renewal that God makes with humanity, which is live a decent life. I will not, I will not destroy the world. I also understand that the nature of the human being is that I give the human being free choice, and the human being is therefore capable of, of doing both great things and, and horrible things. And, and there's a kind of trust that God puts in the universe. And sometimes. We go through history and we look at things that happened and then we were wondering if God really was justified in his trust of the universe because the, the Holocaust being probably the one, the most egregious examples. And then when we think that we've evolved and we think that there's, we've, we've, we've understood the danger of it all, we see that actually it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to abate. And for me, the, uh, the recent uh, fiasco, if I would call it that, the, the recent fiasco with uh, this rapper, Ka Kanye West, who I'm really not familiar with rap, <laughs> not my cup of tea in terms of uh, music, but the fact that there was this egregious and very deliberate statements that he made against all the Jewish people uh, wishing really very bad things on the Jewish people and then hurling very old anti-Semitic tropes uh, against the Jewish people. And the reaction that you see, although from a certain perspective, yeah, people are bearing down hard on him and that's actually bringing out more of it. But what you, the reaction you see all around is, well, there is a bit of truth in it, isn't it? And I even heard this reaction from Jews. So this kind of this kind of um, not being able to to 
create a very clear line in the sand where you take a whole people and malign them for the sins of, of, of some and 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 it's done in an egregious fashion and it really does underscore how much we have not evolved actually since the time of Noah and that what it says in this week's Torah portion that God says, I won't destroy the world because the human being is Rami Nu Arab, is inherently flawed from a young, a young age, is is all the more true. It's a depressing thought, undoubtedly, because we hope that we get towards more light as we get closer to the Mashiach and away from things like the model, away from things like the Holocaust, you would think that humanity would learn and evolve and grow and become better. And we see that there is the, the fault lines of what causes um, dissension, of what causes discord is the same. It's always been the same. It's ego, ego, and more ego. And that ego plays itself out in, in multiple ways. But if you really want to get to the root of it, it's simply ego. And then when, when the ego is hurt, then everything is justified in the name of the ego being hurt. And then that's it. And there's the unleashing of something really, really wicked. So where we go from this is that we draw strength from from those who were able to overcome that ego. And here we have a very interesting connection between the story of Noah and the story of Abraham. Now, in this week's Torah portion, which we're gonna open up in a few minutes, the Torah portion opens up with the story of the flood, a, a sad story. And it ends off on a hopeful note because in the Torah portion of Noah, we have the birth of Abraham. At the very end of the of the book of or the section of Noah, we have the birth of Abraham. We're not really introduced to Abraham in a very deep way, just to know who his father is, where he comes from. And in the next Torah portion, the Torah portion of Lachacha, we are introduced to this personality of Abraham. And Abraham is the anti-ego. Abraham is the antidote to the hate. Abraham is the antidote to the arrogance. Abraham is the antidote to the to the disruption to disrupt to disruption. And we see this in Abraham's personal life and his experiences. And we see it in how he treated people and we see it in how he reacted to tension and we see it in how he charts his way and what draws him. So the antidote to the depravity of Noah generation is the birth of Abraham. And Abraham becomes the shining light. And there is therefore this very interesting bridge between Abraham and Noah. I'm not the one to notice it. This teaching comes to us from our sages. So let's get into the Torah portion, into the Torah portion of Noah. And I want to do a little contrast and comparison between Noah and Abraham and where we can, where where we fit in, in the story of Noah, Abraham, and ourselves. Where do we fit in into this kind of uh, trio or the trifecta? What's our story? Because there is this, an inherent connection between Noah and Abraham. And with that, I would like to kind of, <laughs> sorry for the expression, kill two birds with one stone, which is to really, to connect to the story of Noah, which is last week's Torah portion, and catch us up to where the Torah reading is now, which is the story of Abraham and the, the introduction to the, to the life of Abraham. So let's get into the Torah portion. I'm still letting some people in, so just give me a minute. So let's get into the Torah portion here. And let's see who's waiting to get in. Okay, so let's look at the Torah portion here. The Torah portion opens up, and this is again last week's Torah portion. The Torah portion opens up with the, the the tale of Noah, and it starts off and says, Ela told us Noah, these are the generations of Noah. Noah is tzaddik. Noah is a righteous man. Tamim haya, he was a complete perfect person or perfect. The Dorasav in his generation, es halakim 
his Halach Noach, Noach walks with God. So this is the introduction to Noach. Noach is a good person. Noach is a righteous person. He is perfect for his generation. He walks with God. And we know that Noah has three children, Vayelad Noah, Shlashabanim, Eshem, Ham, and Yafes. Noah has three children, Shem, who is the father of the Semites, Ham, who is the father of the, the, uh, of the African tribes, and Yafes, who is the father of the Asian tribes, according to the Medrash. Batisha Haisa Aris with Melakim, and the, the world was. Uh, very corrupt before God, but and the world became full of robbery. And when we talk about robbery, we're not just talking about stealing from people, but very corrupt. And God saw the earth and behold, it had become corrupted. Because all flesh had corrupted itself on this earth. And then comes the decision of God to destroy the, the world. And he tells, Ad, he tells Noah to make himself an ark and go into the ark and the rest is kind of history. Now the Medrash tells us that Noah built this ark for 120 years. And the reason why he took a long time in building the ark, which was under God's instruction, which, which was to create a conversation piece to get people involved into the saga of the ark. And we know that Noah did do his duty. Noah did everything that was required of him. Noah could be compared to the, to the good student that satisfies the teacher's requirements, gets an A on the test, does what is asked of the student, but is not creative, does not go beyond the requirements, and does not go out of their comfort zone. So Noah is an individually good person. He is not a robber. He is not corrupt. He is not destructive in his personal life. And certainly compared to everyone around him, he was a good person. But he was good in his, in, in his generation, meaning compared to the people around him. And also that he did withstand the people around him. That's what Rashi tells us. Both he was good in his generation and he was good compared to his generation. And the, the upshot of Noah is that the Hasidic masters call Noah a tzaddik in pelts, a righteous person who wears fur. And who is the tzaddik in pelts? The tzaddik in pelts is the analogy that the Hasidic masters give for someone who takes care of his own spiritual needs. So that the analogy is given that if there is a room that is cold, you have two options. One is to find a source of heat and warm up the room so everyone who's in the room can be warm. Or you can grab yourself a warm blanket or a warm coat and make sure that you're warm. So the Hasidic masters say about Noah that he was a tzaddik in pelts. He was a person who put on a warm coat. In other words, he did everything that he had to do. There was nothing that one could point to Noah and say that he was somehow missing righteousness or somehow disobeying God. He did everything he had to do. He protected his family. He followed God, but he did not go out of his comfort zone and he did not try to save humanity. He did save the, the animals, but again, the animals that he saved was on the directive of God, upon the directive of God. So he doesn't take initiative outside of that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing in itself because we know that for a society to function well, what we do need to have is law and order. Once a society starts to have a breakdown of law and order, you have complete chaos and you have complete corruption. And there is a complete sense of helplessness amongst the population. And so whenever we see an increase in crime, a concern about our personal safety, we start to feel we're not safe in our environment, that creates a feeling of helplessness. And it creates a feeling of a breakdown of society. And it, it is, unfortunately, something that is very, very traumatic and, and does create a sense of instability. And, and when we're talking about setting up a civilization, 
certainly that's a, a, a red flag in terms of how a civilization should manage itself. Then at the, at the end of this week's Torah portion, we're informed by the Torah portion, and I'm going to get back to the Torah portion in a minute. Here's my Torah portion. Here we go. So when we get to that Torah portion, let me just share that with you. So we get to the Torah portion. We find out that at the very end, after the uh, after the the flood, after Noah dies, and there is a generation that uh, builds the Tower of Babel and all that. We get to the end of everything. The Torah starts to tell us about who was who was the children of who. So we know that Noah had three children. One of them was Shame, and then it tells us the story of Shame. Who was Shame? And Shame had had another child. His name was Ar Pachshad, and Ar Pachshad had Shil a Shiloh, and then Shiloh had Aver, and Aver had Peleg, and Peleg had. Ru'u and Ru'u had Sirug and Sirug had Nachar and Nachar had Terach and Terach has Avraham. Avraham is, is the famous Avraham. And so we have at the end of the Torah portion, we have the, the, the description of the, the, the involvement or the generations between Noah and Abraham. So the beginning of the Torah portion is Noah and and his tale, and the end of the Torah portion were introduced to Abraham. And Abraham um, is a direct descendant, 10 generations down from Noah. Now we go to the, to, to the ethics of our fathers in chapter five. We have a very interesting discussion about these 10 generations. So let me get to the ethics of our fathers, to the Mishnah. And in, in Mishnah five, it's very interesting that the Mishnah goes into different, uh, the Mishnah of the Perkyavas goes into different waves. And there are, there are these um, poetic almost descriptions. So in Mishnah 5, in sorry, chapter 5 of, Mish, of, the, of the Mishnah of Perkyavot, we come across a series of ideas that are connected to the number 10. So this is Mishnah, this is chapter 5 in the Mishnah Avot. And it starts off with the, with the idea that there were 10 utterances that created the world. And then it goes on and talks about, there's another thing that has to do with 10. And what's that 10? So it says, Ba'asara daras may Adam ad Noah. There are 10 generations from a Adam, first man, to Noah. Ba'idiya kama erech apayim to teach you God's tolerance, because every generation angered him and, and went on. Until God brought the marble, he brought the flood. And then it says, and guess what? There's another 10 here. There are 10 generations from Noah until Abraham. To teach you God's tolerance. Because all these generations really got, ang got angry. God got angry. Until Abraham came and received the reward. So the Torah makes a point to tell us that there is this kind of connection. There's this arc between Noah and Abraham. And that is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems in the generations between Noah and Abraham. But somehow, Abraham is the rectification for the generations that come before him. Now, it goes on, and, we'll, and it talks again about, about another 10, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But before we do, I want to take a moment and talk about the fact that the Mishnah Pirkei Avot is going into this kind of historical record and making a note about the generations between Noah and, and Abraham and you know, Adam and Noah and talking about the number 10 and the, the question that must be asked about, about this type of teaching in the Mishnah of vote is that if you look at, uh, if you look at the Pukyo vote, 
The sages say about Pirkei Avot that this is a book that's supposed to teach ethical behavior. This is a book that's supposed to inspire us to be better people. Another word for the um, Pirkei Avot by the sages is mila de chasedusa, words of, words of uh, kindness or words that inspire righteousness. So the question is, why does the Torah go and the Mishnah specifically and teach us about this ark of 10 generations from Noah to Abraham? There is an inherent lesson in the way we have to behave or where we can derive an, an understanding on how we should behave or even an inspiration on how we should behave by the virtue of the fact that there is this kind of, this kind of ark between Noah and Abraham. So Noah represents the civilization and the and humanity and the flaws let's say of humanity and abraham represents a new way of seeing the world and seeing oneself and seeing god and so we have this arc because we're going to make a contrast between noah and abraham noah represents humanity noah represents the capacity of humanity to um okay so which sages a good question which sages wrote this about the connection with Pirkei Avot, that it's a mila de I will I will find the source but this is repeated often I guess in the Talmud that Pirkei is known it's an alternative name that the Talmud will use for Pirkei Avot. we call it Pirkei Avot, the, the 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 sections of our fathers but when it's referred to by the sages, so I would say in the Talmud, in, in the writings, because don't forget the Mishnah precedes the Talmud. So the, the Mishnah is there before the Talmud. So whether, whether it's in the Talmud or in the writings or later on in, in teachings, when Pirkei Avot is referred to as Pirkei Avot or Avot, and it is also referred to by Mila de Chasidusa, that's an alternative name that the sages give us. And it's very clear when you study the Pirkei Avot that there is supposed to be what we call a Musar Haskel. There's supposed to be a walkaway lesson where we can apply to our lives a certain basic fundamental principle of either uh, ethical behavior or faith in God, which the Pirkei Avot kind of puts, on, puts together that, that there cannot be a disconnect, that there cannot be daylight between ethical behavior and a connection to God, and, and that the two are really dependent on each other. So it's interesting that the Pirkei Avot kind of pivots away and goes into this counting of generations and to tell us, you know, how great Abraham is and the purpose is what? What do we learn from this? So what we do learn from this connection, which we find first in the Torah, and this week's Torah portion, the Torah portion does something interesting. It goes and it kind of delineates the lineage between Noah and Abraham and the players that that it mentions. So the people that are delineated in that lineage are not necessarily personalities or person, persons of interest to us, but the the record is there. And the record is there to create a link. It's to create that arc. And, to, and it is a comparison between two types of, I guess, devotion or being good. Because the Torah is very clear about Noah. The Torah tells us that Noah is a tzaddik. He's a righteous man. We don't find that the Torah tells us that Abraham is a tzaddik. Now, Abraham, what do we call Abraham? What is Abraham called? He's not called a the our father. Our father. Avi Avinu. Avinu. Yes, Abraham is called Avraham Avinu. He's called Avraham, our father. Now, if you look at the lineage, if Abraham is a direct descendant of Noah, then Noah is also, so to speak, our father. So why do the sages pivot away from from that, we don't call Noah our father, even though he is as much our father, if you want to talk about from a biological sense, he is much our father as Abraham is our father, because Abraham is a direct descendant, son from son from son from son, all the way to Noah, and the Torah delineates 
those 10 generations. And the fact that the Torah delineates those 10 generations, as I mentioned before, it becomes a subject of discussion in the Mishnah, a mission that's supposed to teach us something about ourselves and something about our behavior. So that's what I want to un unwrap today is this, this contrast between Noah, who is called Tzadik, he is called righteous, and Abraham, who is not called Tzadik. He doesn't have the appellation of Tzadik. He's called Abinu. He's called our father. What do we learn? And there are certain basic traits that we, we see that we, we see in Noah and that we see in Abraham and we're, why, we are, why we call you know, Noah a tzaddik and Abraham our father. So Noah is a good person. He's a good person. He does what God says. You know, there's a Hebrew expression. Um, for those of you who speak Hebrew, there's a Hebrew expression that says about a goody two shoes, yellow tovi you know, a goody goody. He's a good person, does what they have to do. And that was Noah. Noah was Yalatu Yerushalayim. He was a good boy. He did everything he had to do. But he never went past the point of, okay, this is what I was told to do. Now what? Abraham, what we see about Abraham is Abraham is very connected to God, more eventually. But Abraham's connection to God is, is, much more complex because where God instructs Noah and Noah accepts the instruction unconditionally, we see that with Abraham, the relationship is more complex. Noah was told by God, Noah built a teva, build an ark. I'm going to bring a flood. Your family, by virtue of your goodness, is not going to perish. And not only that, you're going to become the custodian of the animals. I'm going to have you select the animals that I want to save onto the ark, and you will save civilization. And you obviously have the opportunity to save other people. That's why I'm going to give you this long mandate in building this ark so that people have an opportunity to be saved. And we know that actually Noah did not save anyone except for his immediate family. Let's go fast forward to Abraham. We meet Abraham in, in this week's Torah portion. At the end of last week's Torah portion, we just meet Abraham as, as a person. In this week's Torah portion, we are to, we have, we meet Abraham according to, to the Medrash, according to Rashi. Abraham is 75 years old. And at the beginning of this week's Torah portion, he's 75 years old. And we meet Abraham as he is being instructed, just like Noah was instructed. Noah was instructed to build a teva. He was instructed to build an ark. Abraham is also instructed. How is Abraham instructed? So let's look at how Abraham is instructed. And we, we, we've, uh, we've unpacked the instruction itself, and that's not the purpose of our discussion today, because we have gone into the what is being asked of Abraham, but let's just look at the fact that how Abraham is being instructed. So Abraham is told, and this is this week's Torah portion, God also gives Abraham an instruction. What's the instruction? God says to Abraham, Okay, Abraham, I'm going to ask you to leave your country, leave your birthplace, leave your father's home to the land that I will show you. And guess what? Good things will happen to you. I'll make you into a great nation. You're going to be a blessing. I will bless. I will. I will. Uh, I will make you great. And those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you will be cursed. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And what does Abraham do? Abraham, Hashem. So he is like Noah in this way that he follows God's instruction. ito Lot, he takes his nephew Lot. Abraham ben Shanan We are told that Abraham is 75 years old. So we meet Abraham only at a much more mature juncture in his life. It says in the Haran, he leaves Haran. Abraham as Sarai Ishta, he takes Sarah his wife, as Lot ben Achiv, he takes his nephew Lot. Veskol Rechusham in all their wealth, Asher Rachashu. 
and the souls that they made in Kharan. Now, uh, just aside, the souls that they made in Kharan, Rashi says, these are actually people that they influenced in following a one God in, in, the, in monotheism. That is what Rashi says is the nefesh asher asu b'charen, but we can translate it as we wish. Vayetzu lelecha, they didn't have children. Vayetzu lelecha arza kanan, they go to the land of Canaan. Vayava arza kanan, they go. You know, God says, go. You know, go west, my son, and he goes west. West is the land of Canaan. Abraham comes from the east. Vayaver ar Abraham be'eretz ad makam shchem, he comes to the city of Shchem, which is Navla Shchem. Ad Elon More until Elon More, the Haknani Ad Ba'aretz, and the the Canaanites are are the people that live in the land. And we have this promise: Vayar Hashem El Avraham Hashem Avayir Hashem Avraham. Avraham is shown. God shows Himself to Abraham. Vayemer Lizarecha Etenus Eretz Hasayis, and will give this land to your children. Vayiven Shem is Beach Hashem Hanirelav. He is overcome by the fact that he has this vision of God. And he brings an offering. And there, after he comes to the uh, land of Israel, it seems that it's not so simple. So he moves around. He goes to a place called Beis Kel. He pitches his tent in Beis Kel. Miyam in, in the more westward, um, sorry, uh, in the more westward part of the land of Israel. Vahai Mikedam and east to him are the I people. Vayevin Shem is Beach Hashem. He again builds a, a Mizbeach. He offers uh, offering to God. Vayikra B'Shem Hashem. He calls in the name of God, in the one God. Avram is the only one doing this. And of course, something is not very settling, uh, settling there. And so we see that Avram keeps moving. They used to Avram third time. He decides to move to the south. What is going on? Why is Avram? He comes to the land of Israel. And this is the land that God showed him, the land that he's going to give to his descendants. He is moving three times. From the time that he comes into the land of Israel, he moves. And then finally goes down to the south for some kind of respite. He doesn't say why, but we can imagine there are, there are some kind of trouble that Abraham is going through. Guess what? What happens? As soon as he settles there, Bahi Ravar. And there is a famine in the land. There's no food to be had. It's a very serious situation. So Abraham has to go down to Egypt. Because the, 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 the famine is so severe, they're going to die of starvation. So he has to go to Egypt. So let's take a break for a second. Think about this. God told Noah, build an ark. Noah builds the ark, and as he's building the ark, he has faith in God's word. Eventually, the flood comes. Noah goes out with his family onto the ark. The animals are saved. He gets back off the ark. He builds his vineyard. He gets a little drunk. The rest is history, and so on and so forth. But everything that God told him he would do, he did. Everything that God told Noah to do, Noah did. So they have this nice reciprocal relationship where, where Noah does what God wants and God does to Noah what he tells him he will do and and they live happily ever after and Noah doesn't influence his community but he neither doesn't get influenced by his community so let's call Noah you know Mr. Neutral neutral but everything goes according to plan this the Torah calls him a tzaddik he's righteous we come to Abraham Abraham we, we meet him at, at the age of 75. There is a lot to Abraham before. We know that Abraham, through the Medrash, recognized God at a very young age. At that time, he lived in a society where people worship nature. And where he lived, the people worshiped the stars. They worshiped the sun. And they felt that each one was a very strong deity. And Abraham came to the conclusion that if the sun doesn't shine at night, but the stars come out at night, and, the, and our sages say he was a very young child, maybe as young as three years old, that there is something higher than both the sun and the stars and the moon. There's something higher that decides that the sun will shine only for a certain amount of hours, and then the sun sets, and then the that the that the moon comes out at night, and that the moon waxes and wanes 
and that reflects the sun differently throughout the lunar cycle and that the stars are out there in the heavens, but they're not visible during the day so that he starts to see there's something very complex about the universe. It cannot be a rock that is a source of the universe. It cannot be the sun that is a source of the universe. It cannot be the stars that, that are the sources of the universe, or it cannot be the moon that is the source of the universe. And he starts having a very sophisticated understanding of God. And we know the famous story that Noah's father was a, sorry, Abraham's father was a, a person who was a custodian or a curator of good idols. And he had an idol shop and people with not an idol, I-D-L-E, but an I-D-O-L shop. And people would come and buy the idols. And there's a story that the measure says that Abraham seeing his father fashion these idols I thought it was kind of ridiculous because he knew his father made the idols and people would come and buy the idols and then worship the idols. And one time the story goes from the Medrash that his father left the shop and he put Abraham in charge and he said to Abraham, do me a favor while you're gone. Well, I'm gone rather, please feed the idols lunch and give them their food or else they'll be very angry. You know, whatever primitive thought process was existing at the time. And, and Abraham said to his father, like, if they need your food, how are they a God? How are they, how do they have power over you? you? They can't even eat on their own. And he said, and besides, I put the food in front of them. They don't eat. They just, the food is taken away. So you're pretending that they're eating. What is this act of pretending that you're putting the food in front of them? And his father said, no nonsense. They eat in their own fashion. We have to bring up the food to them or else they'll be very angry and they're going to punish us. For not feeding them because they are the gods and so for abraham it just didn't make sense and so what we see with abraham is that one time the, the measure says his father left the shop and he came in and he destroyed all the idols and the only idol that he did not destroy was a very big idol and he put the hammer that he used to destroy all the idols in the hands of the very big idol and when his father came back to the shop his father saw all his valuable merchandise completely decimated. He was furious. And he said to Abraham, what happened here? And Abraham said, you see this big idol? He got really, really mad at all these other idols. And so he just bashed them all down and he killed them. And his father said to him, what nonsense. You know that that idol can't move? And he says, yes, and still you still worship him. So there was an understanding that Abraham comes to with, with God, his own understanding. And this is evolves, evolves, evolves until Abraham feels that he's, he, he is not at peace with the people around him. So he gets this message from God to go to the land of Canaan. And we know that when he comes into the land of Canaan, like we just read now that it's not smooth sailing. He keeps moving. He doesn't get settled in the land of Canaan. And then when he thinks he's getting settled, there's such a severe famine that threatens their very life because they literally are going to die of starvation that they have to go to Egypt. And right after they go to Egypt, we know the famous story that is a very complex and uh, controversial story, which is that Abraham says to his wife, what? Say that you are? That you're my sister. And you're my sister. sister so, that, so that they shouldn't kill me and take you. And we know what happens. They, because of that, they take Sarah anyway, but a, the, the king of Egypt is punished. And he, he gives, he says to Abraham, why didn't you tell me that you were, that was, it was your wife and so on and so forth. And that in itself is a whole controversial uh, discussion. We could have another time about why Abraham lied that way. And that's a whole other discussion. But for the purpose of our discussion today, we see it wasn't smooth sailing. God tells him, go to the land of Israel. That's the land I will promise you. I will give it to your children, children that he does not yet have. Then he goes to the land of Israel and we see he is not settled. And then finally, when he kind of settles down, there's a, there's a famine that really threatens his life. So he has to get some food in Egypt. He goes to Egypt. Now his life is threatened because his wife is very beautiful. He's worried they're going to take Sarah to the harem. And then he lies, and then Sarah is anyway taken to the harem, but returned unscathed. She's protected, but then he has to leave Egypt and come back. And the Torah tells us that that Abraham has all these problems, and then he has a, he has a breakup with his 
nephew and he tries to save his nephew from the from the Sodom. He doesn't have any children. His wife becomes past the childbearing age. And then he finally does have a child. And the child, then God tells him, take this child and offer him to the uh offer him to as a sacrifice. And and he and he he everything that he is promised does not come true. He, God says to him, I will make you into a great nation, but he doesn't have children. I will give you this land, but he doesn't have respite in the land. I will make you very blessed, but he is struggling with hunger. So there is, there is this interesting dichotomy, whereas Noah is a good boy, but God is equally very clear with him. And, and God tells him what to expect. And that is indeed met by Noah. When we come to Abraham, we see that Abraham discovers God on his own in a certain way, it's an inner strength that Noah doesn't have. And not only that, Abraham is not shy to share with everyone who he is. And the, when the Torah tells us, as we just mentioned, that, he, that the Hanefesh Asher Asu Bacharan, the souls that he made in Haran, he didn't have children. So we're, we're told by the Medrash and Barashi, oh, these were people that he brought into monotheism. So he's very, uh, he's very open about it. The Medrash is full of stories that Abraham would, was very hospitable. He would invite people into his tent, but when they came into his tent, he made them bless God. And so he's he's a he's a trailblazer. He does his own thing, but at the same time, God is not God's promises do not come do not come to fruition right away at least. And uh, <laughs> so many years later, we wonder you know sometimes where the blessings for Abraham are. They're 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 kind of lost sometimes. So let's go into back into the to the into the Mishnah actually, the Mishnah that discusses Abraham and his travails. And what does the Mishnah say? The Mishnah says, and let me just share this with you. Where am I? Okay, so back to the 10. So the Mishnah says. So back when we were talking about listing 10. So the Mishnah goes back, Mishnah Avot says, Asara Nisyonis Nasa Avram Avinu Va'amad Bikulam. And there are 10, there are 10 tests that Abraham has with his father, and he surpasses them all. He he actually passes each of these tests. And the Medrash tells us that included in these tests are the fact that he did not settle easily into the land of Israel, even though that was the land that God told him to go to. And then once he settled into the land of Israel, he had continuous problems, whether it was problems of, you know, of, of famine or problems with his neighbors or problems with his nephew or problems with his children or problems with his wives. It was continuous problems. And the Torah tells us that he had these 10 tests, the kulam, but he withstood them all. To tell you of the great uh, love that, that um, Abraham had for God. And then the Mishnah goes on and it gives us another 10. And this is the 10 that the Mishnah says. The Mishnah says, Asar Nisim Nasu Mitraim, 10 miracles were wrought for our forefathers in Egypt. Vasara alayam and ten miracles were brought to the Jewish people when they were on the on the sea. As Esar Makai's Hebia Kadosh Baruch Hu al Mitzrayim al Mitzrayim Mitzrayim. God brought ten plagues on the Egyptians in Egypt. Vasar al Hayam and ten on the ocean. And then it repeats again what we just said here. And then it goes on and it says, Asara Nisyanis. Nisu um, Avesenu, the, the Jewish people tested God uh, ten times. Shenemar Bukali, and they did not listen to my voice. So what we have here is we have a bunch of tens, and the ten that we are focusing on is the fact that Avram had ten tests, and he withstood them all, and then we have the the ten the different the ten miracles that happened to the Jewish people. And what's interesting here is that the our sages say that the word 
nisyonot, uh, which means troubles or challenges, if you look at it, it has the same etymology as the word nisim, as the word miracles. You see, it has nun samach, nun samach. So that there is a direct correlation, say our sages, between a miracle and between a test. Because a test is a form of a miracle, and a miracle is also a form of a test, and sometimes it's used interchangeably. So I want to share with you something that my uh, I, that my husband shared with me, and he has a, he has this teaching in his um, new book that he that he just uh, published. It's called Starting with Sinai, great book, and he's he there's a beautiful teaching here, and and is you look at the language here in this in this uh, in this verse, you see that. Abraham withstood 10 tests, and the Torah, the Mishnah rather, adds, This is, underscores the great love that Abraham had for God. And then, though, when it, it goes on and it talks about all the miracles, the 10 miracles that God did for the Jewish people in Egypt and, and on the sea, it does not tell us. It doesn't say that God performed all these miracles to tell us about his great love of the Jewish people. So whenever we have a similar structure of language, and here we have the 10, the 10, the 10, and it's only with Abraham that the, the Mishnah points out to teach us the great love that Abraham had for God. And this idea of the great love is not replicated here, though you can argue that if God did all these miracles for the Jewish people in Egypt and on the sea, even though the Jewish people tested God, shouldn't it also say to tell you how much God loves the Jewish people? But there's no mention of love here. We also don't have a mention of love when it comes to Noah. We're told that Noah is a good person. When it comes to Abraham, we're told that God loves Abraham. And he did it out of God, his great love for Abraham. Where it comes to the Jewish people and all the miracles, again, using the same language of 10, it doesn't tell us about the love that God has for the Jewish people. It just says this is what God did to the Jewish people. So I'd like to share with you this beautiful teaching. What Abraham did and what makes Abraham unique vis-a-vis -vis Noah, which is a you know our let's say our quintessential good person. What makes Abraham unique vis-a-vis -vis Noah is that Abraham does not get everything that that God promises him. It's certainly not in the order that God promises it to him. In fact, he is consistently tested by God because for every blessing that God gives him, God somehow makes that blessing impossible. Go to the land of Israel that I will show you, but yes, you're going to have to leave that land. I'm going to give you all the blessings and I'm going to make anyone who tries to hurt you cursed, but guess what? They're going to take your, your wife at the border. You're going to come back and you're going to be a great nation, but what? Your, your, your wife can't have children. And then when your wife finally has the child, guess what, you know, maybe I want you to offer that child to, to, to God. So Abraham is consistently tested by God. And the blessings don't pan out the same way. It's not like Noah, where there's an infrastructure. God says, build a Teva, get into the Teva. God brings a flood. He protects Noah, takes him out. His family flourishes. And that's the end of the story. He's a good man who gets saved from his civilization. With Noah, with Abraham rather, we don't see a smooth trajectory. And not only that, what do we see? That in as much as Abraham is truly a servant of God, so much so that he, he understands God on his own, from his own understanding. He comes to God himself. What do we know about Noah, about Abraham? He pushes back against God. When God says to him, I'm going to, he brings three angels to his house, which we're going to learn about next week. And he says to him, I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom. I'm going to give you a blessing for your child. And I'm going to heal you from your brit milah, which, by the way, Abraham did, again, at the age of 99. The Abraham says, one second, don't destroy 
the people of Sodom. Maybe there's some good people there. And he starts arguing with God. Maybe there's 50 good people. Maybe there's 40. Maybe there's 30. Maybe there's 20. So he's very different than Noah. Noah is a yellow Toby Rishalai. No one listens. He does everything that God tells him. Abraham does listens in a way that is actually extraordinarily so because God tells them things and they don't come true. And not only that, when God asks him, God informs him that, by the way, these people are very bad and I'm going to destroy them, which is very similar to what God said to Noah. Go, no, God said to Noah, these people are very bad. I'm going to destroy them. Here, save yourself. God comes to Abraham and says, you know, these people in Sodom are very bad. I'm going to destroy them. And what does God, what does Noah say? What does Abraham say rather? He says, God, don't please don't destroy them. Maybe there's some good people there. Maybe there's 50 good people. Maybe there's 40, maybe there's 20. And so on and so forth. He, he bargains with God. He pushes back against God. He's a lot. His relationship with God is much more complex. But at the end, he follows God through thick and thin, even though his life does not play out necessarily in a very even nice way, like the life of Noah plays out. And the fact that, 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 that uh, Abraham is able to overcome all these travails and does not have the blessings that God promises to him. And yet he still holds on to God and believes in God and not only believes in God, talks to God, um, teaches others about God. So this is the greatness of Abraham. And, and to paraphrase Jonathan Sachs, you know, Jonathan Sachs says about, um, about, about Breshit, that Breshit is a very condensed form of creation. We, we don't really know the secrets of creation. It's, it's very succinct. When it comes to the Jewish people building the Mishkan, we know that it's very elaborated on. And Jonathan Sachs says there that it's much more of an achievement for a human being to create a home for God than for God to create a home for the human being. That's why Breshit is succinct. It's not a big deal for God to do that. Whereas for a human being to create a home for God is quite the deal. In the same vein, Abraham, for, for Abraham to do what God wanted him to do was a far greater accomplishment than God doing for the Jewish people unconditionally. And, the, and that is why God loves Abraham so much. It's because it took a lot more from Abraham to do for God than it takes for God to do for Abraham. And yet Abraham is very connected to God. And so even though he doesn't have the obvious blessings in his life, that does not affect his faith in God. And we know sometimes that our faith gets shaken, especially let's say when we pray for someone and our prayers are not answered. When we see bad things happening to good people, we question God and we say, where is God? Even King David, in, 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 in Psalms, he says, Eli, Eli, lama zaftani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Abraham does not say that, even though seemingly God did forsake him many times. Tells him to, you know, he's going to have a lot, of, a lot of children, but he doesn't have any children. And finally, he gets one and then tells him to sacrifice that child. And he just doesn't at the very last minute. But even Yitzchak has just two children. It's not, we're not talking about huge blessings that are manifest. So that's why. The, 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 the Mishnah says, it's a teaching that I heard from my husband, that God, to show us the great love that God has for Abraham, because what, God, what Abraham did for God as a human being, suspending himself for God is much greater than God performing the greatest miracles for, for, for humanity or for the Jewish people. And the fact that the word nes, as we saw before, the word nes, miracle, and the word nisayon, travails, or tests are etymologically related shows that there's an inherent there's an inherent true connection between the two and it's almost like god like abraham performed a miracle but to god by being so connected to him and where does that bring us where do where do we fit into this great story so we go back to the we go back to the to the avot we go back to the mishnah we look at the mishnah we see as i mentioned earlier that Abraham is always referred to as Avram Avinu. He's referred to as Abraham, our father. And we know Noah is called the tzaddik, the righteous one. But Abraham has the appellation of our father. And 
even though, you know, some people become part of the Jewish people by joining the Jewish people, so a, a Jew of choice. And some people are physically related to the Jewish people. We know that Abraham is the father of those who join the Jewish people biologically or those who, sorry, who are part of the Jewish people biologically or who join the Jewish people by becoming part of the covenant of the Jewish people. And yet he's called Avinu for all of us. So what is the idea of Avinu? And why does the Mishnah always call Avram, Avram Avinu? And why is Abraham called Avinu? So the, the answer is that there's, there is something that happens when when you have a connection to someone, not that he's a tzaddik, but someone is your father. So whether that's spiritually speaking or physically speaking, there's a there, the the use of a father as an example denotes a physical imprint. Like just like a father shares or passes on uh, his DNA to his child, so to Abraham passes on his experience or his strength to us. Now that, that, that passing on either happens, spiritually speaking, someone joins the Jewish people and is a Jew by choice and a Jew by, by accepting the Torah and accepting God, that, that spiritual strength is given to them spiritually. But to understand it, we can just look at a DNA. We know that, that physically speaking, DNA is passed on and that is, becomes the, um, it becomes the imagery that we can use. And what's very interesting is that our sages, say something, and this is repeated very often in the book of Breshit. It's like a mantra that gets repeated very often in the book of Breshit, which is Masa avot the, the actions of our forefathers become a signpost for the children. And interesting, again, Siman, a signpost, has the same, um, it has an inherent connection to the word Ness, because in Hebrew, the word Ness, which is a miracle, also means a, a stick or a signpost. So that the, the actions of Abraham are the miracles that Abraham did for God. Abraham, his nisayon, his test was truly a miracle that he was able to overcome by, overcome. And he makes a miracle for God, which becomes a ness, which is also a signpost for his children for all time to come. And now, and, and, there was, and the, the teaching of our sages is that this somehow irrevocably changes anyone who connects to Abraham to his, to his teaching. It, it, it changes us and it gives us the ability to do what Abraham did. And that's why we always call him Avinu. We call him our father because he leaves an imprint, not only by example, but actually he lives a, a spiritual physiological transformation in us that gives us the strength to overcome and to also go through passages of life where we may, may say, where's God? Where's the answer? And we have that strength from him. And today, uh, with the understanding of epigenetics, which is that we know that genetically speaking, if, if, if a, a person goes through a certain trauma, they, they leave a signature imprint on uh, the genetic expression of the offspring. So they're saying now that they don't even know how many generations this can go on for. So for example, we know that say people who have gone through wars or Holocaust, there is, there is an, there's an um, effect that people have by virtue of, of course, being a child or a grandchild, a great grandchild, someone who went through a trauma because the behavior of that person is maybe, maybe passed on from generation to generation. But aside from that, scientists are now understanding that there are certain genes or expressions of genes that are impacted by the experiences of, of not only of a parent, but also of a grandparent and even a great parent, a great grandparent, and maybe even a great great parent. And there is still like a very new frontier in science to understand how experiences actually shift the reality for, for or the possibilities for the descendants of that person. So it's very interesting that what the sages teach us, spiritually speaking about Abraham, science is now unraveling and uncovering it exists in a physical way. So what the sages teach us about Abraham, that the fact that the Torah tells us that, that Abraham evokes from God a love, and that's because Abraham makes miracles for God. 
in the sense that he holds on to God. And that Abraham is Avinu, he is our father, whether biologically or spiritually, he's our father. This means that we also have the capacity to overcome. And if we say, no, 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 I don't. I'm not that person, I'm not that spiritual person. I don't have the capacity to overcome. Certainly we say every single day in our prayers, we say, God, please do not give us a test. Uh, again, the same word, we ask God not to test us because we don't want a test. The tests are hard and they're hard to overcome. But we see that practically speaking, we actually have endured and have maintained our fidelity to God. And we have maintained our fidelity as a people, even though it's been a very dark history for the Jewish people. There's been a, a tremendous period of what we know as Hester Panim, a lack of God shining on us. And, and, and it continues sometimes. Sometimes we have flashes of blessing and sometimes we'll see darkness and I remember a few months ago, someone asked me the question, of what happens when someone is prayed for and, and the prayers are not answered? These are the Nisayanot. These are the tests that Abraham endured. He already walked that walk and he gave us a, a, a framework. And so that is, why, that is why when it comes to Abraham, he, is, he has the appellation of love because what he does for God is even more than what God does for the Jewish people for the Jewish people and what he does for us is is power forward his strength to us so that if we go through a dark time we can go back and say we have the strength of Abraham of the new he is our father and the the strength that he had and his fidelity to God we also have whether we understand it or not if it's manifest or not but we can draw on it just like a child can draw on the DNA of their father. So that is the bridge between Abraham and Noah and how it relates to us. And with that, I hope we are caught up with the Torah portion and we will go forward. Thank you. That's great, Dvorah. You are fantastic. Thank so you much for joining me. Thank so you for much. joining us. Well, listen, Abraham, is a, Abraham is, a, is, a, is a subject that we can study for a whole year and we will not get to the bottom of it. But it definitely is one of the most impressive figures of all of history. Even non-Jews understand that the whole concept of monotheism, going away from the believing of the small idols, is, some, is one of the greatest achievements in terms of sophistication of humanity. That that uh, that we actually go a certain way going back to there is a kind of there is an idol worship that is today is pretty prevalent, which is the, the idol worship of fame, the idol worship of power. You see this with social media. Influencers, I find this hilarious, but because I'm not of this generation, but influencers, if they use a product, people will use it because they use it. To me, this is an absolute nonsense, but it is a form of, and they even call themselves like influencers or, or like idols or, you know, they're very powerful. And if they say something, then everyone has to take, pay attention. And who, who made you? Who created you? It's, it's need, the need for humanity to, to worship something, to worship someone. So there's, there's a primal need that we look for a lower level of worship and our, our, higher, our higher being, our neshama says, no, no, I want something more than that. There is, there is something beyond the stars. And it's interesting, we call people who are very successful in that realm of influence, we call them stars, movie stars, um, athlete stars, you know, they, we call them stars. And, uh, and, and Abraham said, well, this, it's not the stars that are the true stars. There's a, there's a creator behind the stars. And even, you know, the sun or the moon, there are, there, there's a creator behind it. And we have the ability to go back and dig into that reality. And it, it there's, there's such a sophistication of faith in Abraham that we can work our whole life and not necessarily achieve it, but at least we have our role model and we also have his strength. Whether we know it or not, we have Abraham's strength and we have to tap into it. Whether that strength comes to us spiritually or comes to us physically, we have to tap into it, but he gave us the ability to, to do miracles for God. That is really what the Mishnah is saying, that Abraham 
the reason why God says because of the love of Abraham, because what Abraham did for God is more than what God can even do for us because God is omnipotent. God could do anything. God is so powerful. And, and yet, and yet a human being, which we just learned at the beginning of Parshas Noah, that the human being Noah, what does God come to the conclusion at the end of Noah? That he's not going to destroy the world. Why? Because the human, the human being is rotten. Rami knew of. There is something very frail about the human being. So it is this frail descendant of the human being that is able to overcome his own humanity and to, to, to reach to something much higher and believe in something much higher and not to be influenced by the vicissitudes and the, the jetsam, the floatsam and whatever the latest rages, but to live to live higher. <laughs> in fact, that's why Abraham is called Avram Ivri because he's on the other side of things. And that should give us the strength to, to stand to, up to our own truth, but ultimately to have the faith in God, especially when that faith is challenged. And we will all walk through moments in our life where that faith is going to be challenged and it could be very difficult. But if we go back and we know where we come from, spiritually speaking or physically speaking, we will know that this is our our possibility, and we can and we can uh, we can rise to the occasion like Abraham. So, but Zora, <laughs> is the moral of the story not to complain? <laughs> yeah. No, no, I think I think uh, Abraham challenges God. He doesn't take it lying down. Like not like Noah. Noah actually took everything God said lying down. Like, I'm going to destroy the world. Okay, God. I'm going to build the table. Okay, God. It's not, it's about feeling that there is a creator behind whatever you're going through. It's not that you don't complain. You're allowed to ask God, God, listen, take this away from me. I don't want this test. We're allowed to ask that of God. But if we see that there is no way out, which sometimes happens, we're just, we're just confronted with something which is difficult. Then we say, I can, I can do this. I can I don't have to lose my faith because I'm not really seeing the, the God of my understanding. I, I'm not really seeing the God that I know. Where is my God? We don't have to lose our faith. We can look, look at Abraham and say that he was much more sophisticated. And when he was challenged, he was able to overcome. So that's, that's the strength that we all possess, actually. Whether we, whether we become Jews by, by becoming part of the Jewish nation or if we are, inherit that trait, we, we have that capacity by virtue of our connection to Abraham. So that's that's the good news. <laughs> so I wish everyone a very inspired week, a, a week of open and revealed good, but if if faith is challenged to know that we have the ability to be strong in that challenge and to, to know how much God loves Abraham because of that and therefore be inspired to to uh, to rise to rise to Abraham's level. And, and to know that we, we have the ability to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Have, have a most blessed week, everyone. Thank you. Unfortunately, I miss next week. I'm going for my test, my okay. fifth booster. So that's it. But you're always a pleasure, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Have Thank a great day. Enjoy the fall weather. We're really blessed this week. So enjoy.